Welcome to part three of this presentation on new music business models. My name is Kristen Thompson, and I'm the Education Director for the Future of Music Coalition. Remember that this presentation includes two additional documents available on the FMC website. There's a spreadsheet about how much labels, songwriters, performers, and publishers are compensated for many of these examples. Visit futuremusic.org slash files slash newbusinessmodels.pdf to check that out. There's also a document that explains in plain English how unsigned and indie musicians can get their music into these new music services and how much it costs. You can download that at futuremusic.org slash files slash digital distribution dot pdf. For those of you who tuned into part two of this slideshow, we had a look at how a Dan Zane's record could be found on CD Baby, iTunes, Amazon, and Rhapsody, and the different ways that sales revenue gets back to the artist. In this set of slides, we'll look at two other strategies facilitated by the internet, artist to fan relationships and patronage models. Let's start with artist to fan relationships, in particular, how variable pricing and different incentives have been interwoven into the process. This is the website for Magnatune. Magnatune operates like a digital record label, offering up the works of about 240 artists and 500 releases. A few interesting things here. First, they offer a very high bitrate downloads, much higher than iTunes or Amazon, and these uh, downloads are free of digital rights management. This means they're high quality audio and can be played on any computer or portable device. Second, they offer variable pricing. So when the consumer buys a CD, he or she chooses from a price ranging between five and $18. And third, Magnatune also helps facilitate the music licensing process. You can see on their page, there's two options. You could buy, download, or CD, and then next to that, it says license. So if you're a TV producer or an indie filmmaker, you could go to Magnatune's website and license one of its artists' songs through a very cool system that automatically calculates a price for the license based on usage, duration, and other criteria that you select. So that means there's no negotiations about the license fee, no lawyers required. If you're an artist or band that works with Magnatune, you get 50% of sales or 50% of licensing revenue. Most folks have probably heard about Radiohead's experiment. In fall 2007, they released their record in rainbows via their own website. Consumers who visited the site could pay what you wish, including nothing but a 99 cent processing fee. This experiment was a wild success for Radiohead, generating press and an undisclosed number of downloads, plus sales of physical CDs and a collector's edition. But it's nearly impossible for the average band to replicate this model. Some industry watchers called this a promotional gimmick just to get some free press before the album was available in retail stores in January 2008, but it was clearly a significant uh, thing as they went direct to their fans. As you can see from the slide, however, the experiment is over. In spring 2008, Trent Reznor from the band Nine Inch Nails took the Radiohead model and made it slightly better. Reznor recognized that there are all types of music fans, from the casual listener to the uber fan. So for his most recent release, Ghosts 1 through 4, he offered a range of options. As you can see on this page, it goes from a free download of the first nine songs all the way up to a $300 limited edition package. But it wasn't just available on the Nine Inch Nails website. It was also available on Amazon, at traditional retail, and Reznor seeded the music onto peer-to-peer -peer networks like LimeWire so therefore it was free. Unlike Radiohead, Trent Reznor talked publicly about the financial success of this ex experiment. In the first seven days, Reznor said he made $1.6 million. Again, difficult for the average band to replicate at this level, but it hints at the things that are important in these models. Quality, accessibility, being on many platforms at once, and offering different uh, options at different price points to reflect the different things fans are looking for. One interesting tidbit about this release, Ghosts 1 through 4 topped Amazon's sales list for 2008. Now let's look at a very old-fashioned model, newly invigorated by the power of the internet, patronage. This is the website for Artist Share, which helps fans support their favorite artists through a patronage model. 
Artishare typically works with artists who have established careers and loyal fan bases, which makes it possible for these musicians to monetize the creative process. Pictured on this slide is artist share musician Maria Schneider, who won her second Grammy in 2008. Here's a website page for Maria Schneider's most recent project. As you can see, there's a timeline across the top that tracks the project's development and different levels of financial participation that the fans can fund. And boxes down the side that offer fans different levels of access to the creative process, from studio visits to bigger levels of support like album credits or being listed as an executive producer. For the musicians involved with Artist Share, it's a typical artist label relationship, with Artist Share keeping a small percentage of revenue generated from sales or licensing, and the musicians getting a larger percentage of that revenue. Here's a patronage model done by one artist, Jill Sobule. Jill had a goal of raising $75,000 from her fans to finance her upcoming record. So she offered her fans a lot of different ways to support it. At the $10 level, the fan got a free digital download of the album. At the $5,000 level, Jill would play a house concert for the patron. And for $10,000, the weapons grade plutonium version, a fan could sing on the record. And she did it. Jill raised over $80,000 this way. The record came out in April 2009, and Jill's been on tour a lot and has gotten a decent amount of press, and I assume some good sales from the concept. So here's a, a new entrant on the scene, Kickstarter. Uh, musicians and other entrepreneurs can use Kickstarter to fund their projects. And in the, in the process, though, they keep 100% ownership and control of the idea. Simply, Kickstarter helps the project creators offer products, services, or other rewards to inspire regular old people to support their work. Here's a page for the nonprofit music organization in Philadelphia called Weathervane Music. As you can see, the project pages offer the musicians a way to embed a video, explain the project, and spread the word to potential funders through social networks by offering different incentives for different levels of donations. And they offer uh, keep a visible running tally of the project's fundraising success, and they link to the donors. It's a great way for both the musicians and the project's patrons to see the project climbing towards its financial goal. Just a couple of slides showing two other models. This is Celaband, an online service that sells parts in a band's future work. Music fans can buy a $10 part in a band, and each band must try to sell 5,000 parts to gain access to a $50,000 recording budget. Celaband, as the label in this relationship, gets exclusive an exclusive five-year license for exploitation of the recording, as well as ad revenue and transaction fees. The artist gets 50% split on ad revenues and CD sales from that project if they happen to reach their goal. And this is Slice the Pie. It kind of runs like the stock market, with your song share rising and falling by the day. In the next part of this presentation, we'll look at licensing and new forms of internet radio.